Now it gives me great joy to welcome our dear bishop. You know, during this era, this time period of the world that we are in, we have not many bishops who are really charismatic and who are really blessing the charismatic renewal and who are really one with us and supporting us. So I think we are really privileged to have with us Archbishop Jose Palma from Philippines, Cebu. Shall we give him a big hand? Archbishop. Uh, you know, the Philippines love him that much, I know for sure. And the whole world knows him. And today, we are going to receive the word of God from him. The topic is the mystical, I'm sorry, the topic is going to be one body, one Lord, proclaiming the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So with all these blessings, let us just for a second bow down our heads and ask the Holy Spirit to anoint us that his word may come into our hearts and the word, the seed will grow in us and bear fruit. Amen and God bless you. Thank you so much, Ranjuna, and uh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you all of you for coming back again. <laughs> knowing that you already had lunch, like me, <laughs> and knowing that we come here for a good purpose, and believing that Indeed, we shall receive blessings upon blessings with our presence and participation. Amen. Amen. I ask the podium to be transferred here because I prepared or my secretary prepared a PowerPoint presentation and I'd like to see. First of all, I wear a cassock because this morning when the bishops came here, I was the only one who was not wearing a cassock. <laughs> so I'd like to tell you that I am also a bishop. <laughs> I am a bishop for more than 20 years. <laughs> and a priest for more than 42 years. Thank you. <laughs> Bishop Pelek, salamat. I was wondering why they gave me two conferences. I know Jim is a good speaker and Cyril and, and, and many others. And of course, Bishop Paul and Camilo and uh, Nuncio. Uh, they had all good talks. No? But when I saw my name, I said, why do they give me two conferences? I think this is their way of welcoming me back. By they, I mean the Filipino group to the charismatic renewal. In 2011, I was the Episcopal shepherd of the charismatic renewal. But I asked to be relieved because in 2012, we hosted the International Eucharistic Congress in Cebu. And I said, we have to prepare. So they were good enough to say, okay, no, uh, you, may, you may have your vacation. But now that the Eucharistic Congress is over, they tell me to go back to the Charismatics. I, I said, there are many other bishops. I said, no, but you look more a Charismatic than the others. No. <laughs> I think the reason is in Cebu, I will not ordain a priest if he has not undergone a life in the spirit seminar. I 
And so, whether they like it or not, the seminarians undergo, but after the Life in the Spirit seminar, they all like, no? and they're very grateful. And I believe that in the renewal of the church, the charismatic renewal is a very powerful and certainly you know, the, the gift of the Spirit in the renewal of, of the church. Amen. Amen. Let's give the charismatic renewal a big round of applause. I would like to congratulate, of course, Bishop Paul and all of those involved in this fourth Isau conference here at United Arab Emirates because we're enjoying their charisms put into good use for the past many months. We arrived at 1.30 last night and many of them are working. With, you did not see them perhaps, but we saw them. And we know that the fruits of their work are being experienced by us today. And therefore, once again, shall we give them a round of applause, please? I give a PowerPoint so that after you see me, I want you to look at the pictures. These are the pictures of people whose one foot are already in heaven, like us, no? At least we see their faces. But the whole idea is, I believe they may somehow help explain some kind of a catechesis approach in the topic given to me. One bread, you know, that's a song, but one body, one spirit, one mission in Christ. Picture, please. To us, it comes timely that we have the theme of the conference. And certainly, in the days to come, like a beautiful reality, which is the church, we would be reflecting on this theme over and over again. I believe, like a beautiful picture, we have to take different shots, study different dimensions, reflect on different points, for we know this is the reality of this body, the church. One body, one Lord, proclaiming the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Can we have the picture? Please. Okay. Why unity? Uh, uh, I'm very sorry. So it, it's me who could not say. No? I, 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 I want to see. No? Uh, if, if I, I, I thought it could be seen here. My apologies. No, I, I am not the, you know. <laughs> is, is there a way of, okay. Podium transferred here because I thought it can be seen here. No, I, I should be staying here so that I could look at the pictures. <laughs> yeah, now I can see. Okay. Ah, ah it's, it's also there now. Okay. Oh, uh, also, okay. Y yeah, because a while ago I am only seeing my pictures. I have enough of my pictures, you know. No. In, in fact, I have a picture when I was a new bishop, and I have a change because the people do not recognize me anymore. No? <laughs> that was 20 years ago. Just put the real one, no? the real one. No? Okay, the, the one at my age now. Okay. So one body, one Lord, proclaiming the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I said this is the picture of people whose one foot are already in heaven, no? like most of us. Okay. 
But it's a beautiful topic. In fact, just to tell you uh, about here, uh, one body, one spirit, one mission in the Lord. And this early, I'd like to invite you in 2021. Philippines will be celebrating the 500 years. Five, 500 years of the beginning of Christianity. And Cebu, Cebu is the cradle of Christian civilization. The first mass was celebrated in what is now Sufragan of Cebu. The first baptism was celebrated in Cebu. And the Spaniards gave a gift of the Senor Santo Nino to Queen Juana. And that is the popular devotion, the Santo Nino of Cebu. And that's why in 2021, we're celebrating the fifth centenary. But as we, okay. One <laughs> so if you want to go on vacation, uh, you may go before that. But uh, if you only plan to go once, go in 2021. And if you are in Cebu, pass by the Archbishop's residence and tell me, as bishop, I was there in the Isau conference. Uh, at least that will give you, you know, uh, a right to have coffee or breakfast in my house. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, but I mentioned that because the theme in 2021 is mission. It's like, it's like reminding us the gift we received it's not just for ourselves. It is a gift to be shared, to glorify the Lord and for the good of the community. Amen? That is only the introduction. Why unity? Two other words where the term unity is often found are community and opportunity. Slash the com and occur. And then you see unity. We come together to build community. And by doing so, opportunity is given to us. Opportunity is given to us. Next. And yet, if we think about the psycho-emotional and spiritual reality, Cyril mentioned about starting from Tower of Babel, to Pentecost, when we think about the reality, I'd like to push further, starting from Adam and Eve and go back to Pentecost. Biblical passages showing God's original plan for unity, the orderliness of creation, Genesis chapter 1, and the complementarity between sexes, man and woman, he created them. There should be unity. You see the complementarity. God created mankind in his image, and there's only one God. The image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. But, and this is a beautiful insight, but corruption or sin came into the world. And that's why we begin to understand that even if we desire unity, the reality is there is something, you know, that somehow draws us not to easily realize that. And I want you to remember the word corruption. Those who know a bit of Latin would know cor, that's why we say cordial, no? corruption, corrumpere, meaning to break the heart. Because man's heart is broken from God, in simple language. Because man's heart is divided from God. Because, if I make what's real, you know, like in Babel, they do not want just to obey, they want to be as gods, like Adam and Eve. If there is a breakage from God, if there is separation from God, then the Corruption, corrumpere, also becomes cum, and that means with rumpere, meaning we break down together. 
the dynamics of when our heart is distanced from God, broken from God, the consequences, there's also a broken, distanced relationship from one another. Amen? Even if you just take note what happened to Adam and Eve, after Adam sinned and God was looking for him, where are you? It's like God saying, where are you? Is your heart with me? No, it's not. But then, what happened is, because his distance, his heart is away from God, broken from God, then the next thing that Adam did was, kumrum pere. The broken relationship with Eve, he tried to blame Eve. We blame one another. When we are distanced from God, then we are distanced from one another. I think that's the dynamics that we begin to realize. Amen. You know that already, but I just want to underline that because in, in actual fact, any, any kind of, of s relationship that's broken, that's disorderly, has its start in the heart of the person who, in the first place, is distant from God. Amen. And therefore, no, when God created mankind in his image, we say, our hearts are meant for God. St. Augustine beautifully explained this when he said, Lord, we are made for you and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And yet, when Adam and Eve sinned, I repeat, they were divided from, first from within in their heart. And then they were divided against each other. Consequently, then they were divided among themselves. We see that in Babel. The vision is, first of all, an interior reality that radiates, that affects our exterior relationship. And that's why we see the story of Babel and the Great Flood. While we long for unity, it's just good like a doctor to realize this unity as a tendency. That both Jim and, of course, and Cyril no, has pointed out, and of course, even Bishop Paul, you know, that, that tendency, you know, of this, this unity. No one and no group is exempt from this tendency towards this unity. There is no perfect person, no perfect family, no perfect group. It's just good to realize that there is this weakness or tendency in us. And in fact, the reality that we are all not only tending to sin, but we are all sinners in many ways. Amen. I was touched when I read uh, so far no, the last published book of Pope Benedict. He was asked, when you meet the Lord, what would be the first thing that you tell the Lord? Great man, a genius. He said, if I meet the Lord, I would tell him, Lord, be merciful in judging me, for I am a sinner. Terrific. Of course, even Pope Francis, what's his motto? Miserando at we elegendo. It was an inspiration from Matthew 21, knowing that he is, you know, a miserable sinner, and yet God loves him. But I just want to point out this tendency you know, to, to, to sin and disunity. We are not blind. To this. This unity, a universal tendency. But the good news is, the good news is, God's plan for unity. Next, please. God has a plan to restore humanity and all reality back to him. As I say this, I think of like the feast two weeks from now, or like a little over a week. When we think of the Immaculate Conception, December 8th, 
Amen? Of course, you know, uh, when God has to choose the mother to be of his son, she was freed from sin. Like a pointer to a promise that one day, the Prince of Peace, you know, one who would bring unity would come. The plan revealed through prophets. And finally, we know through Jesus. Hebrews said, in times past, God spoke in partial and various ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And in these last days, he spoke to us through a son. When he made heir of all things and through whom he created the universe. Beautiful. That's why we say one body, one spirit, one mission in Christ. In giving us his son, his only begotten son, the definitive word, God spoke everything to us at once in the soul word and he has no more to say. In Jesus, God has spoken. The longing for unity of Jesus is a beautiful prayer. John chapter 17, verse 20 to 21. And I quote, I pray not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, so that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Here we realize, and I think especially as charismatics, that a beautiful way of proclaiming the love of God is when there is love and unity among ourselves. Amen. Amen. Of course, Bishop Paul has so wonderfully emphasized that, that the witnessing of love. The early Christians are made to marvel. I mean, people are made to marvel at the early Christians in this world. See how much they love one another. Working for unity is an opportunity to fulfill Jesus' prayer. That's why we mentioned, you know, in bringing about community, then we're given this privileged opportunity, this privileged task. Of course, Jim ended up by saying, while it is God's gift, we should be happy that we are made to participate in bringing about you know, this union, this communion in, in our life. I wish to quote Pope Francis when he made mention, and it's more of a lament to make us realize also the realities on the ground. Pope Francis says, it always pains me greatly to discover how some Christian communities and even consecrated persons can tolerate different forms of enmity, division, calumny, defamation, vendetta, jealousy, and the desire to impose certain ideas at all costs. Whom are we going to evangelize if this is the way we act? Unquote. I think these are, as it were, capsulized words that each one of us could reflect you know, on, on our own personal life. You know, because if we want to evangelize, somehow we know we should be witnesses to unity. And therefore, all of this enmity, division, calumny, defamation, vendetta, jealousy should have no place in our hearts. Amen. Amen.
my dear brothers and sisters, instead of belonging to the whole church in all its rich variety, they belong to this or that group which thinks itself different or special. Again, James Sorel and of course even Bishop had, had so wonderfully explained this, no? that, that the beauty of the church is precisely not in uniformity, no? but in our being united in diversity, unity in diversity, diverse and yet united. As an aside, when, when I was a seminarian, we have a procurator in the seminary who likes very much the color blue. You know? And therefore, all the curtains are blue. The paintings of our refectory is blue. You know? Even our glasses, plastic glasses, blue. No? Plastic glasses, blue. You know? The plates, so that they would not easily break. No? Again, plastic plates, blue. And I said, it's all blue, you know. Blue is beautiful. It's heavenly. But if it's practically all blue, you know, it, it becomes like a, a blue world. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry for the terminology. Nah? You know, there's no, there's no more, you know, beauty of, 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 of uh, variety. Nah? Music is not my charism. Nah? But I was just thinking, what if there's only one note, you know? And you go to a literary and musical contest, na? and everybody sings, do, 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 do. And say, okay, we go home now. We have heard them all, you know. <sighs> no, it, it's a boring world now if, if, if there is no, you know, if there is no variety. No? No? And that's why you admire the garden if there are different flowers, you know, different sizes, different colors. But, but of course, I, I would not belabor you thinking of that because w what Jim and, of course, Cyril and Bishop said about you know, the, the, the mystical body with all its you know, charisms and gifts, that we have to appreciate. I think the key word is we should not only tolerate, but we should appreciate legitimate diversity. Amen? I'm halfway. Therefore, Evangeli Gaudium would say, I especially ask Christians in communities throughout the world to offer a radiant and attractive witness of fraternal communion. Just as a way of looking at the reality, unity, and over conflict and eventually we know where we are heading how we can overcome conflict conflicts are real we know that conflict causes or cannot be ignored or concealed it has to be faced but if we remain trapped in conflict we lose our perspective our horizon shrink and reality itself begins to fall apart. In the midst of a conflict, we lose our sense of profound unity of reality. Conflicts are real. We know that. Dealing with conflicts. Next. When conflicts arises, or conflict arises, some people simply look at it and go their way as if nothing happened. They wash their hands of it and get on with their lives. Others embrace it in such a way that they become its prisoners. They lose their bearings, project unto institutions their own confusion and dissatisfaction and thus make unity impossible. But there is also a third way, and it is the best way to deal with conflict. It is the willingness to face conflict. 
head on to resolve it and to make it a link in the chain of a new process. Blessed are the peacemakers. Go back to this morning's sharing. It's simply saying we have to face it and make an effort you know, to reach out, to know that peace can happen if we make an effort. Jesus will say, peace is a gift, but this is also a human construct. There is something that is asked of us in order that we may be peacemakers. Here we say now, human dignity as a starting point. In this way, it becomes possible to build communion and disagreement, but this can only be achieved by those great persons who are willing to go beyond the surface of conflict and to see others in their deepest dignity. I'm sure in many countries where there are different religions, even looking at each other as human beings with the same longings for a meaningful life, for peace in the family, for love, for mercy, for compassion. Part of the invitation for us in, in that beautiful song we heard before the sharing was about the woman by the well. And if we look at that woman, we know that like her, even if we look at our humanity, we have basically the same human longings and hungers. The hunger for a meaningful life, for peace in the family, for love, for mercy. Thus, the Cebuanos have a wonderful word to describe this. We, we use the word pangando, you know. It's the deepest longing of the human heart. And if you look at every person, we share that same longing. And that is from our human dignity. Likewise, we say the healing of the human heart. If you look more closely at this biblical text, we find that the locus of reconciliation of differences is within ourselves, in our own lives, ever threatened as they are by fragmentation and breakdown. If hearts are shattered in thousands of pieces, it's not easy to create authentic peace as, or rather, in our society. And, and therefore, we know what it means when, when we humble ourselves to reach out to a sister or brother and try to heal conflicts, whether it be in the family or in our own community. Amen? Again, the broken heart leading to other broken hearts. As we mention this, we know that here we feel privileged, we feel inspired, and we are strengthened because we know that all of these longings, which actually are God's designs, are not just human efforts. We have the gift. And as we see again, the gift of the Spirit. Amen. Let's give the Holy Spirit a round of applause. The role of the Holy Spirit in bringing about unity. The advocate, as we have heard again, the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in Jesus' name. He will teach you everything and remind you of all I told you. A beautiful reminder. And we were again made to reflect in the time of the apostles before the coming of the Spirit 
they were afraid. They were shy. They hide. But with the coming of the Spirit, they are a new group. Beautiful. They advocate the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in Jesus' name. And of course, this is our advocate. The message of peace is not about a negotiated settlement, but rather the conviction that unity by the Spirit can harmonize every diversity. It overcomes every conflict by creating a new and promising synthesis. And that synthesis that we mentioned has been mentioned this morning, a new way of relationship. Amen? A new way of dealing with one another. As an aside, but a beautiful example. Many of you must have heard of the efforts of the government to read, you know, our country with drugs and, you know, and to Kong has become a common word. We say we support the government in their efforts, but there are other means that we do not agree. I'll just mention this, because with the many who had been apprehended, many who had been put to jail, we begin to realize that one way to respond to this is to attend to the needs of the drug addicts or those who had been caught and accused of dealing with drugs. But two key words I'd like to share with you. First of all, we begin to understand that there is addiction because there is not much communication that happened. You know, either in the family, the relationship usually has been broken. That's very clear. But the other thing I just would like to point out here is, it was Jim, I think, who mentioned that perhaps the Holy Spirit or the church will ask us to think and probably to discover new charisms in our time. Amen? The charisms before are real charisms, but perhaps in response to the need of the times, new charisms, new ways of serving, new ways of responding to the signs of the times, new ministries may crop up. And that's what actually happening in many places in our country, but in particular in Cebu. Amen? I just would like to mention here, because the leader of our uh, charismatic group in Cebu, Monsignor Fred is here, no, but the lady, uh, leader of Sue God, we say surrender to God, <laughs> meaning to say uh, for, for the drug addicts and, and those involved with drugs, the byword now is they may be afraid to surrender to the government, but they surrender to God. And uh, the, the Barino family, the Duros you know, community has come up with drug rehab program to attend to the needs of the drug addicts. And now they even give the rehab program to those who are in the prison cells, you know, in the jail before they're eventually given parole, at least they already have undergone a seminar. Probably uh, it's a little bit of an aside, no, but I just mentioned that because I don't want to forget because I would like to believe that the Spirit may make us discover charisms in our time that would be for the good of the community. Amen? Amen. But I also mentioned that to underline the idea that usually even addiction is because of lack of communication and a good relationship. Amen? Okay, I'll go back to the topic. <laughs> My dear brothers and sisters, charisms and unity. Charisms are meant to build the church. 
the Holy Spirit also enriches the entire evangelizing church with different charisms. This is what I was saying a while ago. These gifts are meant to renew and build up the church. They are not an inheritance safely secured and entrusted to a small group for safekeeping. Rather, they are gifts of the Spirit integrated into the body of the church, drawn to the center which is Christ and then channeled into an evangelizing impulse. It is the com in communion even when this proves painful that a charism is seen to be authentic and mysteriously fruitful. And the basis of our response to this challenge, the church can be a model of peace in our world, says Evangelia Gaudium. Unity in diversity is the work of the Holy Spirit. I am repeating ideas not because uh, it has been so wonderfully explained, but I just would like to underline Differences between persons and communities can sometimes prove uncomfortable. But the Holy Spirit, who is the source of that diversity, can bring forth something good from all things and then turn it into an attractive means of evangelization. Diversity must always be reconciled by the help of the Holy Spirit. I'll go to the next Charisms and the mission of the church. Mending broken hearts. The efficacious presence of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of believers, Romans 5, 5, is the root cause of this unit, of unity, even in its charismatic manifestations. The charismatic gifts given to individuals actually belong to the church herself and are ordered towards a more intense ecclesial life. I think this was again stressed this morning. The gift is not so much given to us personally. In, in Latin, they say it is a gratia gratis data. It is given to us that we may share this with others. Amen. It is a gift meant to be shared. And that's why when we try to make an account of the blessings that we receive. The next question is, how much have I shared the gifts I have received? Because that's the way we can truly be appreciative of, of the gifts. It's like, I always appreciate uh, the, the, many, the many joyful songs we have. I, I think one reason is, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a good singer. And so, I, when others sing so beautifully, I said, I, loud, I clap my hands so loudly. No? That's the way I appreciate the song. No? Uh, but the whole idea is, but can you imagine a good singer who would not sing? No? Can you imagine one who is gifted with a beautiful voice and would not sing? You know? it's, it's like a wasted gift. No? So that holds true with other gifts. God give this to that you know, by putting your gifts at the service of the community, then the whole community is being formed. Amen? How many minutes more? I'm al almost time. I, I, I just tell me now. Okay. Just one page. discerning the authenticity of charisms in view of church unity. Just a few, probably, principles we might say that, that even in our own personal reflection, we may appreciate what we have received from the Lord. This morning we had that exercise. For instance, we say, the primacy of vocation of every Christian is holiness. The Pope has come out with uh, the, the letter Gaudete et Exultate, the call to holiness of all of us. And I think that's why I'm very happy when, when Jim said uh, we are a people whose one hand 
of our hand, sorry, one foot is already in heaven. Meaning to say, we are all journeying to become saints. Amen. We emphasize that over and over again because years ago, people mistakenly believed that that holiness is a calling only of priests and religious. But we're happy that now we, especially in the charismatic renewal, know it's for all of us. Amen. Let's give all of us a round of applause. Then we know the commitment of spreading the gospel. That would be emphasized. We are all tasked. We are all commanded to spread the gospel. The profession of Catholic faith, whether it be you know, through word or action. The, the story on St. Francis came back to me when once it was said of him, he asked, the younger novice, he said, come, join me, we'll, uh, we're going to preach. And so they walked around the city and came back in the afternoon. When they were home, the young novice asked him, Francis, you told me we're going out because we're going to preach. I was expecting you, you know, to come up in some, in, you know, uh, elevated place and began to preach to people. Francis said, that's true, brother. I told you we come out and because we are going to preach. We preach. We preach all the time. Sometimes also by words. So the meaning is all the time we preach. Most of the time, especially you lay people, by your action, by living up to your own state of life. Amen. The witness of a real communion with the whole church. Again, that was emphasized. We should love the church. We should love the church. Recognition of an esteem for the reciprocal complementarity of other charismatic elements of the church. By now, I'm sure we have begun to realize that the beauty of, you know, the church is there's always a place for everyone. One time I asked the, the president of the pontifical uh, committee of the women who are various communities of women which are pontifically recognized. And this nun told me, Bishop, there are more than 2,000 of the different communities recognized by Rome. And I said, about the men, more than 850. And why do we appreciate all of this? Because these are different communities that attend to the many needs of the church. Beautiful, beautiful. So uh, each one of us has a place. Some take care of young babies, others of uh, children, others of adults, others of sick people, old people, all of them. We have a place in the church. Then also, the acceptance of moments of trial in the discernment of charisms, the presence of spiritual fruits such as charity, joy, peace, and certain human maturity, and also the social dimension of evangelization. That we always look at evangelization, the spread of the gospel that bears fruit and certainly uh, gives joy to the community. I like the story of, of uh, the, the Papal Nuncio, you know, that artist you know, who gives joy to a king. The charism that should give joy and hope and make other people good as well. Amen. The final point, two final points. Spirituality of commune, a starting point for unity. First of all, by spirituality, again, we know this, the spirituality of communion indicates above all the heart's contemplation of the mystery of the Trinity dwelling in us and whose light we must also be able to see shining in the face of brothers and sisters around us. 
I'm sure we will go back to this because when we think of unity, we are made to realize that the, that the basis, the source uh, of, of every unity is the Trinity. You know? The contemplation of Father, Son, and Spirit united in the same Godhead. Amen? I was, remember of, I was reminded of a little boy in a catechism class. And, uh, you know, first graders, children, I, I'm sure you heard of the persons in the Trinity. Because that was towards Christmas, said, when we raised the son, yes, he said, who are the three persons in the Trinity? And the little boy said, Melchor, Gaspar, Baltasar. No? That was Christmas, so made me thinking of the three kings. You know. It's not easy to, to, to contemplate the mystery, but we have to, be, to face the reality that indeed it is the Trinity. Second, connecting with others. The spirituality of communion also means an ability to think of our brothers and sisters in faith within the profound unity of the mystical body and therefore as those who are a part of me. It has been mentioned no, this morning. That's why uh, it's not difficult to, to, to state this because you know this already. No? I'm just underlining. This makes us able to share their joys and sufferings. Also to sense their desires and attend to their needs to offer them deep and genuine friendship. I believe in many countries with different uh, religious or religions, if we could be united, you know, in, in faith, somehow we can be good neighbors, we can be friends. You know, and, and even us down south, uh, that's also a challenge you know, that we can be good neighbors. Others as a gift for oneself. A spirituality of communion implies also the ability to see what is positive in others. To welcome this positive gift and prize it as a gift from God. Not only as a gift for the brother or sister who receive it directly, but also as a gift to me. It's, it's a grace of God to be able to, to recognize the giftedness of every person and to be able to see it, not just as a gift to him or her, but also she or he becomes a gift to me or, or to the community. Finally, we say making room for others the spirituality of communion means finally to know how to make room for our brothers and sisters bearing each other's burdens, Galatians 6.2, and resisting the selfish temptations which constantly beset us and provoke competition, terrorism, distrust, and jealousy. Let us have no illusion unless we follow the spiritual path External structures of communion will serve very little. That's why we say it's not so much the external, but it is actually you know, the relationship that matters. Perhaps a good way of reminding ourselves is we are not here to compete with each other, no, but to complete each other. No. It is in realizing that each one of us has different gifts that we complete you know, what I may lack as a gift others have it and therefore when all of us put our gifts at the service of the community we see how complete the community is the final point I'd like to make is the Eucharist especially for us Christians many of you some of you, I should say, have, have the opportunity to, to, to visit Cebu during the International Eucharistic Congress. I take this occasion to thank all of you for coming. 
I mean, for, for visiting Cebu at that time. Na. We appreciate your presence then. Na. Last, last uh, November 8 to 10, we were called to Rome just to share the fruits of the Eucharist. The fruits of the Eucharist. And of course, we made mention about how we try to beautify our churches because we believe God is in the beautiful. God is in the beautiful. We try to make into, you know, perpetual Eucharistic adoration chapels. We try to give lect seminars to our lectors, cantors, choir, those things. But also, we underline this point. Because that year after the International Eucharistic Congress, the Pope came out with the year of mercy. The year of mercy, you will recall. That's why we, we try to remind people of the spiritual works of mercy and the corporal works of mercy. And we often quote the president of the International Eucharistic Congress, Archbishop Piero Marini, when, when he said, when we receive the Eucharist, when we say body of Christ and we respond, Amen, it means, first of all, that yes, the host that I receive may look like bread, but Christ is present here, divinity, you know, humanity, and of course the entire uh, Jesus in his divinity and humanity. Amen. But he said, when we also say amen, the body of Christ, we mean that we who receive become the body of Christ. Amen. amen. That's why there's a beautiful song, many of you know, one bread, one body, one people. And again, as so beautifully explained this morning, just as in the body, the strong comes to the aid of the weak. The more healthy comes to the aid of the sickly. Very spontaneously, that's what we are, you know, because we are one body. You know, one body, you know, the mystical body. The Eucharist becomes the source of our strength and joy in believing that what we do you know, to one another certainly strengthens the body of Christ and makes Christ's body truly a reality in our midst. I say this just to end because now I am forgetting the time. That precisely because we are here, we should all be grateful and we should feel privileged you know, that we are once more you know, reminded one body, one spirit, one mission in Christ. And then, of course, with one hope that what we do is our way of sanctification and our way of journeying towards heaven. Our call to action is our call, first of all, to pray for unity pray for unity. Perhaps it would not be much if during our prayer, even after this, we can offer a prayer for each other, like, you know, our, as our intention, you can tell the Lord, Lord, I pray for all the members of the charismatic renewal all over the country. The Pope says, yeah, the springtime of renewal in the church, bless them, you know, with, with peace only you can give. And things like that. It's a way of uniting ourselves with each other. Of course, besides our prayer, living the spirituality of communion, which we have underlined, which of course we already have heard, is also our way of realizing this beautiful challenge from the Lord. After all, you know, when we know we are loved, even when we were sinners, we are loved. But more so, you know, that we have become children of God through baptism. More so that we have become temples of the Spirit because of confirmation and because 
of Life and the Spirit Seminar. More so, you know, that we have made a commitment to offer ourselves and our charisms at the service of the church. With more reason, we have to believe, you know, that the work of God, which we are privileged to share, can become truly a reality in our midst. To all of you, once more, no, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to be with you. And may the Lord continue to bless us today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, that the Isau Conference may be truly remembered as an opportunity for all of us to appreciate that we are one body, that we are one spirit, and we have one mission in Christ. To all of you, praise the Lord. Thank you so much.